friends, I'm Pastor Kevin of Faith Lutheran Church in Grand Rapids, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to our online worship service for Sunday, July 16th. This is now the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Today we're reminded that God's word is like the rain that waters the earth and brings forth vegetation. It's also like the sower who scatters seed indiscriminately. Our lives are like seeds sown in the earth. Even from what appears to be little, dormant, or even dead, God promises a great harvest. Through Christ's word and presence, we're fed with the bread of life that we may bear fruit in the world. Our worship begins this morning as we confess our sins, confident of God's gracious forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, and whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned. We have hurt our community. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The grace that is Christ's gift to us, the love of God, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, in the bond of peace, be with you all. Please join me now in the prayer of the day. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. first reading assigned for this seventh Sunday after Pentecost is from the prophet Isaiah. We're going to read from the 55th chapter. We'll read verses 10 to 13. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar, 
shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm assigned for this morning is Psalm 65. We're going to read the first two verses and then jump to the fifth verse and read from 5 to 13. You are to be praised, O God, in Zion. To you shall vows be fulfilled. To you, the one who answers prayer, to you all flesh shall come. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the oceans far away. You make firm the mountains by your power. You are girded about with might. You still the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the clamor of the peoples. Those who dwell at the ends of the earth will tremble at your marvelous signs. You make the dawn and the dusk to sing for joy. You visit the earth and water it abundantly. You make it very plenteous. The river of God is full of water. You prepare the grain, for so you provide for the earth. You drench the furrows and smooth out the ridges. With the heavy rain, you soften the ground and bless its increase. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths overflow with plenty. May the fields of the wilderness be rich for grazing, and the hills be clothed with joy. May the meadows cover themselves with flocks, and the valleys cloak themselves with grain. Let them shout for joy and sing. Here ends our reading from the Psalms. The second lesson assigned for this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans. We'll be reading from the eighth chapter, verses one through 11. Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, we prepare our hearts for the gospel. The gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly 
since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seed fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So friends, I am just back from Stony Lake Camp where once again I felt honored to watch a, a group of amazing young people on the camp staff sow the seed of the gospel to an amazing group of even younger people who had come from all around the state. 110 campers, I'm told, ranging from elementary to high school, and these kids, they came in all sizes, shapes, colors, and dispositions. The smallest campers were about yay big, the tallest camper was a six foot nine inch high school senior. We had kids that were so excited to be at camp that they simply had to run every place that they went. And we had kids that were so homesick that they were on the verge of tears for the first couple of days anyway. But each of these campers was offered the very best that the camp could provide. The food, the music, the opportunities to hike, swim, play games, sing, do crafts, and learn about the love of God through Christ Jesus. Not one was denied. Not one was written off as unworthy. And I'm thinking of all this now in the light of our gospel parable for today. The parable of the sower out there sowing the seed. As I was preparing this sermon, I ran across a comment by a man named Eugene Boring. And he said, in the preaching of Jesus, parables were not vivid decorations of a moralistic point, but were disturbing stories that threatened the world of assumptions by which we habitually live, the unnoticed framework of our thinking within which we interpret other data. As I read that, I thought, well, okay. That's kind of a fresh slant on the parables. I mean, I usually find them so well known that they seem like the comfort food of our gospel texts. But if Mr. Boring is correct, they should instead be that exotic food, that spicy and rare and odd food that lies close to being the repulsive thing that you'd never choose to taste. But if you did, it just might change how you think of food in the first place. So as I was thinking about this parable of the sower through that lens, I got to thinking, just how is this a disturbing story? And it came to me rather quickly once I'd given myself permission to think about it in that way. It's disturbing to me because the sower is so blasted wasteful. I mean, seed is precious. Good seed is costly. And who would hire a sower who would cast it on the, the hard path or the rocky ground or out there among the thorns? It would be like me buying expensive seed for my lawn and pouring it in that little green rolling spreader thing and then rolling it around the house and doing the yard with it and then doing the sidewalk and then meticulously spreading it on the concrete driveway and on out into the street in front of my house. I mean, what a waste. 
And I can't imagine God hiring such wasteful sowers. I mean, a good sower isn't just a person with a a strong arm for casting the seed. A good sower has to be a person who recognizes the kind of soil that has at least a chance of producing a yield from the precious seed, right? So as I, I played this parable through my mind with my mind open to it being a disturbing story, I pictured the owner of the farm calling in the wasteful sowers, the ones who had spread it on the rocky ground and among the thorns and handing them their pink slips right then and there. Except that's not in the story. Instead, Jesus just tells us that the odds aren't great for seeds that fall on those types of soil, but there's no warning not to cast it there. In fact, it's just assumed in the story that it will be cast there. Maybe even that it ought to be cast there. Which makes me stop and wonder just what kind of a God we have. And I'm rather shocked to find that we may have a God who is wasteful with that precious seed. We may have a God who intentionally hires sowers who are willing to cast that seed out somewhat indiscriminately, and I wonder why. So I search my mind for examples of other people who sow the seed of their message, whatever it may be, indiscriminately. And what comes to mind are those who are certain that their message is correct and urgent and vital to the world. Take those who believe that climate change is impacting our world today and will impact it even more harshly in the future. If you believed that that was the case, and if you believe that you have just this slim window of opportunity for our world to take action and do something meaningful that will abate the most damaging effects of climate change before it dooms future generations to miserable lives, well, then I guess you might not worry too much about where you cast the seed. If that were the case, you might be willing to share your message with those who might welcome it, but you also might be willing to cast it on the hard ground and on the sidewalks and in the middle of the highways. And that made me wonder if we really believe that the seed that we have is worth being planted at all. I mean, when you stop to think about it, most often we in the church plant seed only for the most selfish of reasons. We plant seed because our attendance is down and we're worried that our church will no longer be able to support itself, which is fine, I suppose. But I think that the larger reason to plant the seed is because we actually think that having a relationship with God through Christ Jesus is a life-changing and life-giving opportunity. If we think that knowing how loving and powerful God is can truly give our neighbors and our world a sense of hope and the strength to go on living with and, and supporting others, even through the toughest of all times, well, then maybe that's a reason to sow. And if we've experienced God bringing us peace and hope that's lifted us and set us free from the destructive ways of our past, then maybe we know how impactful it can be. And maybe then we become willing to cast seed on, in, and around even the most seemingly seed-resistant environments. Because, well, you never know. I met this camper at camp this past week whose eyes I've never seen because they were always covered with sunglasses. And the rest of this camper's face was just like this stone statue. There was never a smile, never a laugh, never a a glimmer of light. When this person was called on to say one thing that they liked about camp that day, this person said, nothing. When I said, how was your dinner? This person just shrugged. When I asked, are you enjoying camp so far? This person said, not really. And always with this expressionless face. 
And if I were a betting man, I'd have said that person is rocky ground. That person is the hard path. That person would be a, well, a waste of good seed. But then one day we got on the bus and we headed down to Lake Michigan. And this person was with a, a couple of other folks and they decided to, to go in the water. But there were three of them and they had to each have a buddy. And so they figured that they couldn't go in without leaving someone out. So they just wouldn't go in. Oh, well, shrug. Until a counselor said, well, why don't you ask that kid over there to go in with you? And one of the kids walked over and sure enough, the kids said, well, sure. And the four of them waded out into the water. And when they came out, I asked how it was. And one of the kids said, it was deathly cold. And another said, it was all right. And the one who I was ready to write off said, it was great. I love cold water. I've been swimming in Lake Superior and Lake Erie and Lake Huron before. It doesn't matter how cold it is. And that kid right over there, you see that kid? He went with us so that we could go. And there was a smile across this person's face that just wouldn't stop. And I thought, there it is right there. The good soil peeking through. And what came to me was this realization that I'm just no judge of soil types whatsoever. I don't know rocky soil from good soil, but if there was ever soil that just might make good use of God's good seed, it's that soil right there. And left to my own devices, I might have skipped over it entirely. Friends, the good news of God's grace is abundant. It's precious and priceless, but God provides the seed lavishly and he calls us to share it indiscriminately. I pray that we will offer the hope of our Lord with all we meet through gentle smiles, open words, and sacrificial actions, whatever it takes, for the sake of those who hunger and thirst and always and only to the glory of our God. Amen. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness. Now our worship continues as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. Guide your church, O God, to sow seeds of forgiveness and righteousness on good soil. Direct your people to proclaim your love in this congregation and throughout the world. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Sustain your creation, O God, by sending favorable weather, causing trees and fields to grow, 
protecting waterways from pollution, and instilling in all people the need to be good stewards. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Maintain peace among all people, O God, and raise up lawyers to work for justice in the courts, advocates to speak for the downtrodden, and politicians to work on behalf of the common good. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heal those who are sick, O God. This morning we especially lift to you Sue, Dorothy, Myrtle, Cecilia, Cheryl, Phyllis, Bishop Saturn, Kim, Ron, John, Inez, Jacob, Pamela, Grace, Denny, Fatima, Brody, Jim, Jerry, Marianne, Mike, Ray, Ron, Blake, Mary, Christine, Jeanette, Ben, Nancy, Randy, Rob, Claudia, and all those who live or work at the Samaritas Lodge, Woods, and Terraces. We also ask that you would guide health care workers to care for those who suffer, scientists to conduct life-saving research, and counselors to care for victims of sexual abuse and exploitation. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Answer the prayers of those gathered in worship, O oh God. Protect those who travel near and far. Accompany visitors to this congregation and nurture our faith. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Inspire us by the faithful departed, O God, examples of your embodied love, whose confidence in the resurrection guides us in living lives worthy of the gospel. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, in the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Great is the Lord, He is holy and just, by His power we trust in His love. Great is the Lord, He is faithful and true, by His mercy He proves His love. Please join me now in our offertory prayer. God of field and forest, sea and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with the gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us that the world may be fed with your love through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received through your word and presence. Send us now to spread your generosity into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. receive the blessing. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest sea, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Go in peace. Share the harvest. Thanks be to God. my heart a fountain ever springing all things are mine since I am his how can I keep 